I'm I'm assuming I'm live. I can't really tell. Um, let me check my phone just to be sure. I've I've set this up a little differently than normal, so I just want to see if uh, if this is working. And it appears to be. Okay. Yes, it's working. I just checked my phone. I'm trying something a little different this evening. I know that a lot of our uh, young people are younger, I guess, teenagers, and a lot of the younger people are not on Facebook as much as they are on Twitter, Instagram, and uh, things like that. But maybe if a young person doesn't hear this lesson, maybe an adult will, and you can share it. Uh, with a young person. If there's a young person near where you are right now, you might want to invite them to come and watch what I'm about to present. We live in a culture that is quickly, very quickly, um, just not believing in God. We're being told there's no God. Uh, the young people are being told that. They're not given any valid reasons for it. But that's what they're being told, and since they maybe don't have any way of figuring out anything different, uh, maybe they just they just accept it. And we, as adults, especially Christian adults, have a responsibility to try to help young people to uh, believe there's a God. You know, I'm talking to Christians probably for the most part, right now and it doesn't do a lot of good to talk to some young people about uh, the Bible if they don't believe that the author exists who is God it doesn't do a lot of good about to talk to them about salvation uh, in Christ Jesus or his church if they don't believe that there's a God or that this book came from God so I want to look at something basic tonight. I'm trying something different. Let's see how this does when I turn it around and put this camera on my computer. I see I'm getting a reflection, but that's that's all right. I'm in my small office at home, and that's about as close as it will get. You don't have to see me anyway. Seven reasons to believe in God. The first reason to believe in God is that matter demands a maker. The second reason to believe in God is that life demands a life giver. A third reason is that design demands a designer. A fourth reason is that intelligence demands an intelligent creator. The fifth reason is morality demands a moral law giver. The sixth reason is the Bible's supernatural attributes. And the seventh is the empty tomb of Jesus. Let's look at these one by one. Seven reasons to believe in God. Now, some people might say, well, you know, you're starting in the Bible, and I don't believe that the Bible came from God. Let's just analyze quickly the first verse in the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Those are the first words in Scripture. Now, think about this. In this verse, in this one verse alone, you find the five basic elements of science. Let's see what they are. The first one is time in the beginning. Time. Time began when God created the heavens and the earth. Secondly, the second basic element of science is force. In the beginning time, God force created energy. So you got Three basic elements in the beginning, time, God force, created energy, space, that is the heavens, and the last is matter, that's the earth. Isn't that interesting how you find the five basic elements of science in the first verse of the Bible? Do you Now, Jesus attributed the five books of, uh, first five books of the Bible to Moses. Do you think that Moses just was smart enough to figure that out? Or that there was this God with all wisdom behind this. And, of course, we know, according to Scripture, all Scripture is given by God. 
Moses didn't figure this out on his own. So thinking about it, one of the reasons to believe in God is that you have the five basic elements of science in the first verse of the Bible. Matter demands a maker, for example. You think about the earth, and, and I, I analyze it every day. I think about it every day. I think about Earth's life. I think about the sun. I think about the moon. I think about night. I think about day. I think about seasons and how all these things continue uh, on a regular basis and how that this Earth just is suspended in space and here we are. But matter doesn't just come from nowhere. It doesn't just come from nowhere. Now, I'm using the Bible again, but just let this verse help us. Hebrews 11 and verse 3. By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared or made by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. Matter is not eternal. Every scientist knows that matter is deteriorating. You don't have to be a scientist to know that things wear out. The Bible teaches that the earth is wearing out like a garment. But where did it come from? Well, it had to have come from somebody who made it. So the, the first basic element of science is that matter demands a maker. you got the five basic elements of science in verse 1 of Genesis and then the believe in God. Matter demands a maker. Somebody had to make this. It's unreasonable to say that the earth just happened, and that we just happened, when you consider our intelligence, and some people may question that, but I'm not trying to be over humorous. We are intelligent. So, secondly, we have life. Picture the image on the left of the screen where you're under a microscope and you see these living organisms that the naked human eye cannot see without high-powered magnification. And there's life in there. Where did that come from? Life has to come from life. Even we learn that from our Earth's experience. Rocks do not have any life. Rocks do not reproduce. But there are living organisms that do and will continue to reproduce. Where did that life come from? Obviously, life came from life. You look at the ultrasound of a baby in the womb. Well, we know how conception takes place. But where did the first human come from? The Bible said as Paul was preaching on Mars Hill to philosophers who they didn't know who God was, much less who Jesus was. And they'd asked Paul to speak because he'd been preaching in the marketplace. But one of the things he said on Mars Hill to those philosophers and these people that always came together to talk about some new thing, he said, he himself, God, gives life uh, to people and breath and all things. Where did the breath, first breath come from that caused the first human being? Evolution is nonsense. There's no chain of evidence that proves that evolution is true. People are telling children this. There's no evidence for it. People just make those things up. Who put breath into that pile of dirt that ultimately will die that we call the human body? Well, the Bible says that in Genesis 2 and verse 7, that God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul or a living being. Life came from God. Think about life demanding a life giver, human beings. We already talked about that for a moment. Where do children come from? Well, they come from adults, males and females, who are able to copulate and reproduce, but where did they come from? Think about the zebras and their uniqueness. Aren't they a lovely animal? But where did they come from? What caused life? Obviously, life demands a life giver because nothing cannot, something dead cannot produce something alive. There has to have been 
an eternal being of some sort that's always lived, whether we understand that or not, it has to be so. And then I think about this. Here we go back to Genesis again, chapter 1, verses 24 to 25. Then God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures after their kind. Stop. Zebras uh, reproduce zebras. And there, there are some animals that can crossbreed, but you take like a mule, uh, uh, I mean a, a burro and a horse, but the mule that comes from that cannot reproduce. Everything reproduces after its kind. you got cattle, creeping things, beasts of the earth after their kind, and it was so. God made the beasts after the earth after their kind and the cattle after their kind and everything that creeps on the ground after its kind and God saw that it was good. Now I have a question for the non-believer in God and creation. Why doesn't this make sense? It's true. It's, it's, uh, you cannot argue against what this passage is saying. We know it's true and that has not changed since the dawn of time. So you think about human beings. Genesis 1, 28. So God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Life brought forth vegetable life, plant life, animal life, and then human life. God made man after his own image and likeness. Genesis 1, 26 and 27. Man is not an animal. He is a uniquely different creature. But life has to have come from a life giver. Thirdly, you talk about design. I like to see things that people design, like take a house. I think it's amazing that a person can can build a house. There are things that are far more detailed than that that human beings are able to design and build and construct. I think the computer that this program is in is simply amazing. But who would believe that, uh, that if I'm just walking along the beach one day, say, you know, uh, I found this on the computer, I mean, this computer on the beach, and somebody says, where'd it come from? I said, it didn't come from anywhere. Oh, somebody had to make it. No, 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 it just came from nothing. You know, that sounds silly, but people are saying that about the universe. They're saying that about Earth. They're saying that about everything that's alive. The Bible it's clear and helping us again. For every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. And so a lot of scientists are coming around to the idea that, hey, things are designed. And designed things must demand a designer. Well, we know that a house had to have a designer, and it's not really all that detailed. You think about the human body. Think about this for a moment. In the average child's body, there are 60,000 miles of blood vessels. I said that right. In the average adult, there are 100,000 miles of vessels, veins, vessels, all those things that transport the blood throughout the human body. To me, that's simply amazing. Now, who designed the human body? You know, no one you no one would believe that your I know the watch illustration is old, but hey, it's still valid. Nobody believe you if you said this thing came from nothing and yet we say the human body did. Think about our muscular system. Tie all these things together, the brain, the nervous system and all these and your organs and how they function. The human body is amazing creation designed by God. So the third argument for the existence of God is that design demands a designer. Now, David noted this in Psalm 139, verses 13 through 15, For you formed my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. And my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you, and I was made in secret. Obviously, he's talking about in the womb and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. Depths of the earth is a figure of speech for a mother's womb. Now, 
David knew that God formed his inward parts, and I'll tell you what, he formed yours too. There is a designer. Our fourth reason for believing in God is that intelligence demands an intelligent creator. Now, whether or not we question people's intelligence, I know people make jokes about that, but let's face it, we are intelligent creatures. We may not always be wise. We may not use our brains the best ways, but we are intelligent creatures. Now, you take the woman, the human being, and the robot. And is is a man-made robot more intelligent than a human? Well, of course it's not. It it is programmed by humans. Think about it. If humans made the robot, and we know that they do make the robots, then who made the human? And the human's far more intelligent than any robot. Our fourth reason for believing in a God is in an intelligent creator is that intelligence demands an intelligent creator. Our fifth reason is morality. And morality demands a moral lawgiver. Now, there's a lot of questions on the table about what's right and wrong. It affects every facet of our society and our culture. It's a major issue in politics and the decisions that lawmakers and politicians make. And it's created a lot of division and hatred and bitterness among humans. But let's think about it. We're human beings. We have the ability to know right from wrong. When's the last time that you saw two monkeys sitting around and talking about right from wrong? Just just imagine this. Of course, they don't speak um, because they're not, they're animals. They're not even close to being human. That's right, Judy. We're not supposed to do that. Are you sure? Sure. Yeah. When's the last time you saw animals carrying on that kind of conversation? But humans have that kinds of kind of conversation all the time. So morality demands a lawgiver. Think about moral decisions. You make them lying. Is it wrong? Some people say it's not. You know, it's funny how they say it's not till somebody lies against them. Then all of a sudden, it's very wrong. So morality becomes a very subjective discussion. You know, it's like, well, what's wrong to you is wrong to you. What's wrong to me is wrong to me or vice versa. You know how that goes because there's no standard. But now think about it. Lying is wrong. And most people would agree that that for the most part it is, um, unless it's them and they're trying to get away with something they shouldn't. And that's immoral. Stealing is wrong. And some people don't have a problem with it until something of theirs is stolen and all of a sudden it's wrong. Well, we know it's wrong. Murder, is it wrong? Is it wrong for one? Yes, it is. And people understand that. Our newscasts are just uh, all the time talking about someone killing someone. And I mean, every day we know it's wrong. Uh, it's wrong to to abort a human being in the womb. Like it or not, we're human beings in the womb. Uh, destroying property and so forth, these questions. How do we know right from wrong if there's no God? Who told us, who programmed us to believe that right and wrong even existed? Now, we know that... Uh, Animals are on a totally different level than we are, and they they don't do things like we do. But see, they don't they're not made in the image and likeness of God. God gave us the ability to choose, but we know right from wrong. But the question is, how do we know that it's even a subject to discuss? Somebody put it in us. It came from a moral lawgiver. And it came from somebody far more intelligent than we are. And, of course, he's given us a book to go by. If people would read it, they'd know the difference, and we could all be together on it. But David would say in Psalm 119, verse 104, from your precepts I get understanding. David, from reading the law of Moses, which he was under, he said, I understand when I read your precepts, your laws, I understand. And he says, when I see what God says, 
I hate everything that's false. And the difference in what he would um, understand and what is false is that what is false is contrary to what God said. You know, if people would just get with the Bible on morality and, and how to treat one another and just do it, we'd solve most of our problems. There's always going to be somebody bucking God's system. But there's a standard, and it's the Bible. And so think about number six. The sixth reason to believe in God is the Bible's supernatural attributes. Now, you've probably seen this, but I'm going to present it again. There are 66 books, 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New, 66 different books. And these books were produced by 40 different writers. Now, let this sink in. You've got 66 books, 40 different writers, over a 1,600-year period. Yes. Now, now think about this. This is the Bible, and you got three different languages, primarily Hebrew in the Old Testament, Greek in the New, and some Aramaic peppered here and there, but primarily the two, Hebrew and Greek, and then some Aramaic. Um, and these writers came from three different continents. Continents. I didn't say cities. I didn't say down the street. So you've got this time gap of 1,600 years. You've got three continents apart, 40 different writers, and there are no contradictions. Somebody says, I know a contradiction. Most people wouldn't know a contradiction if it met them in the middle of the road at high noon. noon. There are no contradictions in the Bible. People try to come up with them, but if you'll study it, you'll find that things that seem to be contradictory, they're not. They just seem to be. Um, and then the seventh one is the empty tomb of Jesus. There are people doubting the existence of Jesus. Uh, I don't understand that. With all the evidence of the New Testament, you got all the... 27 books, and there's not a one of them that didn't talk about Jesus and all the 300-plus prophecies in the Old Testament that Jesus fulfilled, by the way. And then, of course, finally, Jesus was crucified by the Romans because of the Jews' desire to have Jesus put to death. They killed him. They crucified him on a Roman cross, and within about six hours, Jesus died. Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea went to Pontius Pilate and asked for his body. They put Jesus' body in Joseph's tomb, and then the Romans sealed it, and they guarded it. But Jesus came out the third day like he said he would. Now, there's no question that Jesus lived. It's total, utter nonsense to say Jesus never lived. This is something else that our young people are being fed, but they're not, they're not testing this. But then he did live, and he did die, but where is he? Where's his body? You know, the resurrection of Jesus is, is the ultimate proof. It's the ultimate proof that Jesus was the Son of God. There was a man by the name of Saul of Tarsus, and you've probably read about him in, in uh, the book of Acts, and then, of course, he wrote most of the New Testament. He didn't believe that Jesus was real, and he started crucifying Christians and had some put to death. Then, uh, But Jesus finally appeared to him. It's recorded three times in the book of Acts. But uh, I want to come back to this uh, resurrection here in a moment. Matter, number one, demands a maker. Life demands a life giver. Design demands a designer. Intelligence demands an intelligent creator. Morality demands a moral law giver. The Bible's supernatural attributes prove there's a God and the empty tomb of Jesus. Now I'm going to turn the camera around and see if I can't get it adjusted and that worked pretty good and I'm pretty happy with it but in Romans chapter 1 
Paul is writing a letter to the Christian of the church at Rome. And he's writing according to verse 3 um, concerning his son, which came from the prophets, verse 2, who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh. Jesus was human. And who was declared the son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead, according to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul is saying here in Romans 1 5 that the ultimate proof that Jesus was the Son of God was the resurrection. When you think about these seven reasons and in and Jesus being the ultimate, what do you think about him? Who is he? Who is he to you? I know who he is to me. I know who he was to Paul. Paul said he was the son of God with power by the resurrection. So he's alive and he's sitting at God's right hand. So, of course, the Bible cl- uh, declares okay. Jesus One option is right. Jesus to be the son of God. Think about these seven reasons and study them. And if you would like, I would be... Here's what I found on the web. I'm sorry about my phone. It's picking up my voice. If you'd like a copy of this uh, keynote, uh, I'll send it to you as a PDF. Uh, Just send me a private message on Facebook. I'd be happy to share it with you. I hope you all have a great and blessed evening. No need to apologize. And this compute phone is driving me nuts. I'm not sure I understand. Hang on a minute. Turn Siri off. She's wonderful when I need her. Have a great evening and God bless you.